let's look at the axilla. The axilla is also referred to as the hand piece, and it is the region that is located inferior to the shoulder joint. So between the upper limb and also the lateral wall of the thorax, we have the hand pit. So this is the hand pit highlighted in purple. What are the functions of the axilla? The axilla provides a pathway for vessels coming from the neck region and also the thorax. So it allows these important vessels to pass through it down to supply the upper limb region. Also within the axilla, we have lymph nodes that provide immune function. Let's look at the outline of the axilla. How is it configured within the space that it is located? It is a roughly pyramidal shaped space that is created, as we have said, between the lateral wall of the thorax and also the upper limb region, which is inferior to the shoulder joint. So for it to be pyramidal shape, it's going to present an apex, and this is the region of the apex, which is above. Then it has a base or a floor, which is below. Then it has four walls, which includes the anterior wall, the posterior wall, the medial wall, and also the lateral wall. Just as the name implies, the walls are four in number, and they are so positioned based on the anatomical relation with the body. So that is how the walls are presented. So we have the apex, we have the base, and we have four walls. So let's look at each of these region and see what they are structurally made up of. So for the apex of the axilla, the apex of the axilla is also referred to as the cervical axillary canal. It is seen, of course, at the topmost region of the axilla. It is truncated triangular space, a three-sided boundary that is directed superior medially. So it's directed superiorly and also medially towards the neck region. And it does this so as to be able to receive vessels that are coming from the neck region so that they can pass through it and also supply structures of the upper limb. So that is the aim of why it is directed towards that part so as to position itself in receiving vessels that are coming from the neck region. So the apex of the axilla forms a triangular boundary upward as I lighted here. So let's look at the structural configuration of the axilla. The apex of the axilla is formed by a bony convergence of three bones. So posteriorly, we have the upper part of the scapula, and this forms the posterior boundary of the apex of the hand pit. Medially, we have the outer border of the first rib. This is the first rib. So the outer border of the first rib forms the medial border of the apex, while anteriorly, we have the clavicle. So these three bones, the scapula, the first rib, and also the clavicle form the apex of the axilla. And the pattern by which they form it creates a triangular configuration. That is a three-sided configuration. And that is what we see here. This marks the beginning of the axilla. So this is where the axilla begins from. Vessels that are coming from the neck region, we need to pass through this canal that is also referred to as the cervical axillary canal before they can now fully enter into the hand pit. And of course, we've said that it creates a path through which vessels and nerves will be able to assess the axilla. So the base of the axilla, we said that it's roughly pyramidal. And for it to be pyramidal, it's going to have an apex and also a base. We've talked about the apex that is formed by a bony convergence of three bones. For the base, the base is concave. It means it is indented and it is formed by three structures. The first structure is the deep axillary fascia. This is the axillary fascia, which is an extension of the pectoral fascia, which covers the pectoralis muscle in the chest region. So this fascia, that is related to the pectoralis muscle tends to extend towards the axilla region where it also forms a fascia that is termed the axillary fascia. So that is the deepest layer that forms the base of the axilla. And this is followed with the subcutaneous tissue. After the subcutaneous tissue on the external, we now have the skin. So that is the way the layers come. It is also important for us to know that in hard dots, the base of the armpit is seen with air, the walls. We already said that we have four walls. We have the anterior wall, the posterior wall, we have the medial wall, and also the lateral wall. So this is the medial wall. This is the lateral wall. And of course, we have anterior wall, which is in the anterior view. Then we have the posterior wall, which is behind. So let's take a look at the walls and see what they present. For the anterior wall, as the name implies, it is located in the anterior region of the hand pit. And the structures that form the anterior wall of the axilla are muscles. 
Okay, so we have the pectoralis major. This is the pectoralis major that is elected in green. It extends from the anterior part of the chest and it extends to also cover the anterior region of the axilla. Then deep to the pectoralis major, we know that the pectoralis major is superficial to the pectoralis minor. So deep to the pectoralis major, if you open it up, we see the pectoralis minor. This is the pectoralis minor highlighted in black, and this also forms the anterior border of the axilla. Then furthermore, we have the subclavius. The subclavius muscle, as the name implies, is located below the clavicle. It also extends to form the anterior border of the axilla. So these three muscles are the muscles seen in the anterior wall of the armpit. If you look at this image below, this is the axilla, and this is the anterior portion, and this is the posterior portion. If you look at the anterior portion, you see the pectoralis major that is highlighted in red. Then deep to the pectoralis major, we have the pectoralis minor. Then we now have the subclavius. This is the subclavius below the clavicle. The clavicle is highlighted in white and below it, we have the region that is highlighted in blue that is called the subclavius muscle. So these three muscles form the anterior border of the hand pit. Then going further, it's also important for us to highlight the anterior axillary fold. The anterior axillary fold is a fold that is created in the anterior border of the axilla, and this is formed by the pectoralis major muscle. So this pectoralis major muscle that is highlighted in green is thin, and it forms like a fold in the anterior part of the axilla. So if you look at the anterior part of the axilla, you see a fold that is created around that space, and this is formed by the pectoralis major muscle, which is one of the muscles that forms the anterior Brother of the armpit. So it extends for that to create the fold in this region. This is also good for us to highlight the clavic pectoral fascia, the suspensory and also the axillary fascia. We said that when we talked about the base of the axilla, we talked about it being concave in nature. It means it creates like a deepened configuration around that space. This is expressed due to the arrangement of these three structures, the clavi pectoral fascia, the suspensory ligament, and also the axillary fascia. So let's see how these three come together to create this indentation that is seen around the axilla. So if you look at this deep muscle, we already talked about this pectoralis major, then deep to the pectoralis major, we have the pectoralis minor. Then Above it, we have the subclavius muscle. The subclavius muscle is surrounded by the clavipectorial fascia. After surrounding the subclavius muscle, it descends down to also enclose the pectoralis minor. Then after this, it then runs more inferiorly to connect with the suspensory ligament. The suspensory ligament then connects it to the axillary fascia. This is the axillary fascia, highlighted below in dotted black. This is the suspensory ligament, and the suspensory ligament is what actually creates this indentation because it connects directly to the axillary fascia. This is the axillary fascia. We already talked about the axillary fascia as one of the deepest layer that forms the base of the axilla. When we talked about the base of the axilla, which is followed by the subcutaneous and also the skin. So this is the axillary fascia, and this is what the suspensory ligament connects with. So it tends to connect the clavipectoral fascia to the axillary fascia. And as it does it, it tends to draw the axillary fascia upward, thereby creating that indentation. This is the clavipectoral fascia that encloses the subclavius muscle. It extends a bit and opens up to enclose the pectoralis minor. And this is how it runs, highlighted in black. After enclosing the pectoralis minor muscle, it is now connected to the suspensory ligament, and this is the suspensory ligament. The suspensory ligament is what then now attaches to the axillary fascia. And its connection with the axillary fascia is what creates that concavity, thereby creating a form of pulling effect. So it tends to pull it up, and that is how the indentation is created around the axillary region. And this is the axillary fascia as we've highlighted as the deepest layers of the axilla. And this is where it tends to create the concavity around this region due to the pulling of the suspensory ligament that is connected to the clavipectoral fascia. So the posterior wall of the axilla is the wall that is created around the posterior region, and it is chiefly formed by the, the subscapularis. We know that the posterior part, we have the shoulder blade, which is also referred to as the scapula around that region. So we have the scapula and also anterior to the scapula, we have an indentation that is created that is called the subscapular fossa. Within the subscapular fossa is where we have the subscapularis. So this muscle and also the scapula forms the posterior border of the axilla. 
And this is the subscapularis. If you go below the subscapularis and also the scapula, you see the, the teres major muscle and also the latissimus dose muscle. And this is the teres major muscle and this is the latissimus dose muscle. These two muscles form the lower region of the posterior wall of the axilla. So the entire posterior wall of the axilla is then formed by the subscapularis the teres major muscle and also the latissimus dose. Where we see the subscapularis in the upper region, the teres major and the latissimus dose muscles are seen in the lower part of the posterior border of the axilla. So this is what forms the posterior border of the axilla. Also, it's good for us to highlight the posterior axillary fold, just as we stated in the anterior wall of the axilla. For the posterior axillary fold, we also have a fold that is created at the posterior part of the axilla. And this fold is formed by the latissimus dose muscle and also the teres major muscle. So this is the posterior axillary fold that is created by the latissimus dose and also the teres major muscle. So looking at this image below, we have the configuration of the axilla. This is the anterior compartment and this is the posterior compartment. In the posterior compartment, we have the scapula. This is the scapula highlighted in black. And anterior to the scapula is the subscapularis muscle, which helps to fill up the indentation that is created in the anterior part of the scapula, which is called the subscapular fossa. So we have the subscapularis, and inferior to that, we have the teres major muscle, and more inferior to the teres major, we have the latissimus dose muscle. That's the way they are arranged, and they form the posterior wall of the axilla. So going further, we have the medial wall. In the medial wall, just as it states, it's the region that is close to the body, and this is formed by the upper four ribs and also the corresponding intercostal muscles. And these are the ribs. We have the intercostal muscle between the ribs, and these are the intercostal muscle. Then we have the serratus anterior muscle, highlighted in red. This is the serratus anterior muscle that helps to cover up the ribs, and also the intercostal muscle around this region. So you have these three structures forming the medial wall of the axilla. Then laterally, the lateral wall has a different presentation than the other walls, in the sense that it is narrowed at that end. So we have the anterior and posterior border joining at the lateral side where it becomes narrowed. So it is narrow at the lateral side, while on the medial side, it is wider. We have the intertubacular groove or bicipital groove. The intertubacular groove or the bicipital groove is an indentation or a depression that is created between the greater tobacco and the lesser tobacco of the humerus. So it is created around this region and this forms the lateral border of the axilla. And this is highlighted in green. We also have the biceps brachii muscle the long and the short head, which is highlighted in black. Then we have the coracobrachialis that extends from the coracoid process of the scapula down to the humerus. So these three structures will form the lateral boundary or wall of the axilla. So if you look at the configuration, you see that they are laterally placed. Then going to the content, we have the axillary artery and its branches. We have the axillary vein and its tributaries. We also have the axillary lymph nodes. We have the brachial plexus, although we have specific regions of the brachial plexus within the axilla. We have the long thoracic nerve. We have the intercostal brachial nerve. We have fat, then we have the axillary tail of spines in some cases. So let's take each of these structures to see how they are placed within the axilla. The axillary artery begins at the lateral border of the first rib. This is the first rib highlighted in blue, and the axillary artery will start from this region, enter through the apex of the axilla before it finally finds itself within the axilla. And the axillary artery is a continuation of the subclavian artery, which is the artery that passes below the clavicle from the name subclavicle, subclavian. So this is the subclavian artery. And after passing below the clavicle, it finds its way through the apex to enter into the axilla. Within the axilla, it gives off a number of branches, after which it exits the axilla. And at the inferior border of the teres major muscle, this is the teres major muscle highlighted in blue. Beyond this region, it will be transformed into another artery, which is called the brachial artery. So you can see that the axillary artery initially begins as a subclavian artery before it becomes the axillary artery. Then finally, it is transformed into the brachial artery. Then the next is the axillary vein. The axillary vein runs medial to the axillary artery. This is the axillary artery highlighted in green. And medial to it is the axillary vein that is highlighted in black. This axillary vein superiorly 
it continues as a subclavian vein, while inferiorly it continues as a basilic vein. So you can see that it's just as we have in the axillary artery, so also we have in the axillary vein. But within the axilla, they are termed the axillary vein. And what the axillary vein does is that it receives venous blood from the parallel branches or corresponding branches of the axillary artery. So this is the axillary vein within the axilla. Then we have the axillary lymph nodes. We know that lymph nodes perform immune function. And the way they are distributed in the axilla is so distinct and unique. They are arranged in five groups and the names of individual group is given based on the region where they are located. So we have the apical axillary lymph nodes. As the name implies, it's located around the apex of the axilla. And this is the apical axillary lymph nodes. Then we have the central axillary lymph node that is centrally located. And this is the central axillary lymph node. We also have the anterior or pectoral axillary lymph node. This is located in the anterior part and close to the pectoralis muscle. And this is the anterior or pectoral lymph node. Then we have the posterior or the subscapular lymph node that is located behind, and this is highlighted in white. Then we have the lateral lymph nodes that is highlighted in black that is laterally located. So the names are so given based on the regions within the axilla where they are located. And of course, we know that the function is to perform immune function. Thus, the brachial plexus is also is located within the axilla, but it's good for us to know the specific region of the brachial plexus that is located within the axilla. But if you go and check up our lecture on the brachial plexus, we know that the brachial plexus is is made up of the root, the trunk, the divisions, the cord, and also the branches. So out of all this region, it is the cord region and also the branches that are located within the axilla. We know that it begins from the lateral side of the neck, from the C5 to C8, and also T1 spinal nerves, and they descend down because their main target is to supply the upper limb with sensation and also to impact movement around the upper limb region. They need to pass through the axilla for them to be able to reach the upper limb region. But the region that is seen within the axilla at the cord region and also the branches. And this is the region seen within the axilla. Then going further, we have the long thoracic nerve. The long thoracic nerve is also a branch of the brachial plexus, but it is not a terminal branch. If you go and check up our lecture on the brachial plexus, we know that the branches of the brachial plexus can either be terminal or non-terminal branches. We have a non-terminal branch, which is the long thoracic nerve that is within the armpit. And we know that the long thoracic nerve emerges from the spinal root C5, C6, and C7. You see them highlighted in red and they descend down, passing through the axilla before they finally supply or innervate the serratus anterior muscle, which is what they innervate. But they pass through the axilla before they are able to innervate this muscle. Because when we highlighted the walls of the axilla, specifically the medial wall, we stated that the serratus anterior muscle is part of the component that forms the medial wall of the axilla. So it tends to pass through it before it's able to innervate the serratus anterior muscle. And this is the long thoracic nerve. So this is the long thoracic nerve in this image. You can see it extending from the C5, C6, and C7 cervical spinal nerves, and it descends down to supply the serratus anterior muscle. Then intercostal brachial nerve. Intercostal brachial nerve emerges from the lateral cutaneous nerve. We have the intercostal nerve that emerges from the thoracic region. And as they emerge, they give off the lateral cutaneous nerve. The lateral cutaneous nerve is to supply cutaneous innervation around the thoracic region. What happens is that the individual lateral cutaneous nerve, as they emerge from the intercostal nerve, they divide into anterior and posterior division. If you look at the lateral cutaneous branch from the first intercostal nerve dividing into posterior and anterior region, and that is the way it does it down. But the second lateral cutaneous branch of the second intercostal nerve that emerges does not divide into anterior and posterior division. So what it does is that it continues without dividing as the intercostal brachial nerve to supply the medial side of the arm and also the axilla. So this is the first lateral cutaneous branch from the first intercostal nerve. You can see it dividing into posterior and anterior division. And that's the way they do that as they go down the tract. But the lateral cutaneous nerve from the second intercostal nerve does not divide into anterior and posterior division. What it does is that it continues to supply the medial wall of the hand and also the axilla. You can see them giving branches to supply the medial region of the arm 
and also the axilla. So they refuse to divide into anterior and posterior division like the other lateral cutaneous nerve. So as it continues, it is giving the name intercostal brachial nerve. So this is the intercostal brachial nerve, which is a continuation of the lateral cutaneous branch of the second intercostal nerve that emerges from the thoracic spinal nerve. They are also one of the structural components of the axilla because they are also seen to pass through the axilla before it finally gives off branches to supply the medial wall of the arm and also the axilla. We also have fat tissue. These are areolar tissue highlighted in black. We have the axillary tail of spans in some cases, and this is the extension of the breast tissue into the axilla. And this is the axillary tail of spans or the axillary tail of the breast that extends into the axilla. This extension is seen at the upper lateral quadrant. If you divide the breast into four quadrants, we have the upper medial quadrant, lower medial quadrant. This is the lower lateral quadrant, and this is the upper lateral quadrant. So this is where the extension comes from, and it extends into the axilla in some cases. So clinical anatomy or application, we have the intercostal brachial nerve block. The intercostal brachial nerve block that we described as one of the structural components of the axilla, which is an extension of the lateral cutaneous nerve that extends from the intercostal nerve that refuse to divide into anterior and posterior division can be used for nerve block during surgery. When surgery is needed to be carried out around the arm or the axilla region, it can be used for local anesthesia. Also, we have the spread of breast cancer. The spread of breast cancer can also extend to the axilla because we describe the lymph node receiving links also from the breast region. So this can cause the extension or the spread of breast cancer to the axilla region. We can check our understanding of this lecture through the following questions. The first one is to explain the boundaries of the axilla. We've described this in details. Also describe the configuration of the cervical axillary canal. We know what this means if we've gone through this video. The third question is to list all the contents of the axilla. Then the next one is what muscles form the anterior and posterior axillary fold. So we can go through this question. I'll be expecting our responses in the comment section. So thanks for watching this video. Let's meet again.